Hey there, hope all is well. Welcome back to some more RTD News updates. And so today's articles are of a large variety, um, dealing with, as you see here, the Federal Reserve, Jenny Yellen's most recent speech. And then I have a couple here in regards to inflation, cash in society, some about gold, some about China. So, you know, these news articles here are, are all over. And so I wanted to basically get into this first one here. And as always, if you find these short news summaries to be of importance and informative, Feel free to share them so we can try to get more people in tune to what's going on in our global uh, monetary system. So let's dive into this one first uh, from the Wall Street Journal. And so this has to do with uh, the summary of uh, uh, Jenny Yellen's speech. But yet one thing that kind of stood out uh, from this whole article here is the idea that Jenny Yellen lays out tools for next recession fight. And so it kind of seems like um, there's already a push to kind of prepare the people, prepare the public for some things that will need to take place in order to help get us through this next recession uh, that's already underway, uh, in my opinion. A lot of uh, people I've interviewed in the past kind of hinted at the fact that the numbers are already lying up to kind of indicate that we're already in a recession. It's just not made public yet. And so a couple things here that stood out that's, that's quite interesting is the fact that Ms. Yellen said the main tool could be bond purchase programs, which the Fed used during the during and after the 2008-2009 financial crisis, spending its portfolio of assets to more than $4 trillion today. It says, in addition to taking the federal funds rate back down to nearly zero, the FOMC could resume asset purchases and announce its intention to keep the federal funds rate at this level until conditions had improved um, markedly. And so just one other thing is the only thing they can do is pretty much, you know, print and buy, um, you know, liabilities from the government, which, you know, as they've seen, hasn't really worked. But they're going to continue to do what they know how to do, which is to print and counterfeit things. It says what was striking was also the fact she left out the, her playbook for battling future recessions. There was no mention in her comments of negative interest rates an approach tried by the Bank of Japan, European Central Bank and other central banks in Europe. She also played down some controversial ideas being debated by economists and policymakers in her remarks on the Federal Reserve Bank. Blah, blah, blah. So basically, you know, just weeks after San Francisco Federal President John Williams made the case for considering a higher inflation target. So those are just things that are thrown out there. Higher inflation targets. So basically, 2% is their goal as of now, which basically is a two percent tax or two percent devaluation. They're talking about possibly you know, upping it down the line. So between bond purchasing, increasing inflation rate, or possibly going negative, those three or four things there are, are things that I would imagine they are discussing and probably are actually on the table, but they're not going to, you know, make that mainstream just yet. So more things in this article to check out if you're interested, definitely worthwhile. Moving on to the next one. This next article here is from Nesman. Um, and it has to do with the idea of the cash of society, as I mentioned. And so this uh, article here does a good job of, as to going to going through how the recent um, push to digital payments have really increased. And so he basically starts off with, you know, a quote from Ron Paul saying that a cash of society is the IRS dream. Total knowledge of and control of the finances of every single American. And so just to show how the push for digital payments has have increased, it says, according to Fed data, digital payments have risen from just 60 billion in 2010 to an enormous 619 billion this year. It says some estimates show that 80 percent of consumer purchases in the U.S. are now electronic. And so without really even having much of a mandatory push to get rid of cash, just for the sake of convenience, people are choosing to use their phones or any type of digital methods they have, more so out of convenience sake, not really realizing that they're playing into the whole cash for society idea that favors central banks and favor governments because it limits a person's choice as well as their um, ability to have privacy. And so here's another quote here I thought was interesting. It says, it's talking about, you know, over in Sweden, how 
they're predominantly a, a cash society. It says cash transactions now account for just 2% of the economy over in Sweden and it's one of the couple other countries. But it says, but as we'll see in the case of Sweden, the cash society is also used for something far scarcer. By combining a cash society and negative interest rates, they effectively flush out any hidden or saved wealth. You can't save money because negative rates mean you're paying the bank. You can't withdraw it because it's useless in a cash society. There's nowhere to hide. And so that's the whole idea, in my opinion, of the whole cash society is to bring out all that old money, all that old wealth and put it out there, especially here in the U.S. because we're a consumption based economy. They need people to spend and not save. Saving is becoming dangerous for the central banks. And so a lot more things here is discussed. Definitely a good read. A lot of interesting links to the other articles or whatnot. So something to check out. And then towards the end, he gives a hit his viewpoint or their viewpoint on how to really pres preserve and protect yourself. He says, basically, you can start holding small stashes of cash in safe places or ultimately get into precious metals that's held outside your local government, things like that. So something definitely to think about. Links below if you are interested in checking it out. Here's some news here about uh, what's going on with the SDR and the Yuan. And so um, coming up in October, it looks like there will be the inclusion of the Yuan into the SDR basket of global reserve currencies. And so this article here just basically gives a little information as how uh, there will be issued some uh, bonds. It says the float is seen comprising three-year bonds totaling 500 million SDR units this comes to about 700 million though the value of the international monetary fund reserve assets vary based upon dollar euro and yen in japan and uh, the pound but starting this august at the end of august the world bank will issue bonds denominated in special journal rights in shanghai so these are all historical things that are you know just are, are new and it's all in preparation for uh, the yuan becoming a part of the international basket and, and also being recognized as a part of the national or the, the global reserve currencies to pretty much compete against the dollar. So the whole idea of rethinking a dollar deals with the fact that those outside of the United States have already begun to rethink the future of monetary policy and the, the dollar is not you know, going to be the primary or only source of power for countries to use. And so I think this is a part of the push to basically diversify out of the dollar or out of the Federal Reserve note more likely. And so here's a great article here. It gives more information as to some dates and times and things dealing with this new inclusion of the yuan into the SDR basket. If you're interested, check it out. This next article here is from the Daily Reckoning and it's from Naomi Preens and it's in reference to the new power elite part two, the U.S. and China escalate energy war. So she starts off with just talking about Elon Musk and how um, his solar city and the things he's doing is really changing the game. And he himself is put positioning himself rather along with, you know, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg and Jeff Bezos from, from Amazon as being considered the power elite just because they're changing the game. They're pretty much doing things on a different level in regards to energy and basically just changing how commerce is done. And so she's starting off by saying that these power players here are, you know, they're they're bigger than governments now because they are, you know, global names and global people. And then she leads right into uh, China's next two moves against the U.S. And so she starts off by talking about how, you know, energy will play a major part in who and how um, countries dominate each other. And so it says China is challenging U.S. for world influence right now. First, China is leading the way in wind, solar, and associated investments domestically and abroad. Geopolitics is strategically important and always at work. No more uh, now more than ever. The competition between China and the U.S. can be can break depending on who has power over dirty energy and who can find alternatives to the fuse of power. It says China has a long-term view of the global dominance offered by the shifting power paradigm. Central banking is the second key to this shift. China is undermining U.S. dominance by making the yuan a viable option to replace the dollar as a world currency. And so she goes into you know why this is since the 2008 crisis, China and some things China has been doing, and basically just you know preparing the yuan uh, to enter the world as a, an alternative to the dollar. Then she goes on to talk about the G20 meeting that's being held in September and how China has a strategic plan by hosting this to basically, you know, 
prepare the city uh, that, they, that they're in, how the, you know, show the world how they are ready to be a player in this game as far as being a reserve currency. So she goes on to give a couple more things here. Definitely a good read. She always does great work. So if you're interested, you can check it out for yourself. Here's another article from SRS Rocco Report, and it's entitled Gold and Debt, the 1929 Great Depression versus the Next Great Collapse. And so here it's like a four-part series. He starts off talking about, um, you know, oil production and how, you know, he goes throughout history. In 1929, you know, oil production uh, from that point was relatively high, so the Great Depression itself wasn't felt as badly as it will be for this next um issue or depression or collapse that's coming type of thing basically because the oil production uh shale oil and things like that is is projected to be a lot lower so he goes to a lot of interesting statistics from reports and whatnot and basically saying that you know back during that era there the oil u.s the u.s oil industry in 1919 was finding 1200 barrels of oil for each barrel of oil equivalent energy it consumed in, in exploration so you get 1200 barrels for, for one per one now he's saying basically um it's it's five to one so just goes to show the how uh, sharp of a decline it has been just in the oil and energy sector then he goes on to talk about debt he says comparing u.s debt 1929 to today and basically saying that in 1929 there was a total of you know what do you say here um, there's 19.4 I'm sorry 16.9 billion, which according to if divided out amongst the population was equated to 139 dollars per person, debt wise. And then in today, 19.4 trillion divided by 320 million equals 60,625 per American today as far as the total liability. If each you know citizen was expected to you know contribute or pay for that, which ultimately we do through taxation, but um, here just interesting graph how that graph just really shows how astronomical the debt has become per citizen. So he goes on here to talk about you know just the national debt in general and how ever since 1957, uh, for the most part, which is the last year, uh, the the actual debt was reduced or declined. And it's been on a straight roller coaster right straight on up since 1957 so that's 58 consecutive years of uh, ever increasing debt and then he goes on here talk more about energy or whatnot then he gets into comparison of the mining sector how home stake mining in 1929 versus barrett gold today so he pulled out a report from from historical charts showing how much um investors or whatnot from mining shares and the mining production you know, during 1929 in comparison to today. And of course, it was, you know, far better then as far as the dividend received upon earnings uh, from the um, investing in these stock companies from today and, and yesteryears. So it just gives you a little comparison how, you know, from the grade of ore that came out the ground, you were able to get 0.22% of ounces of gold, whereas today, Barrick has to dig, you know, 100 million ounces or pounds of, or, of ore, and they get barely uh, enough to make one tenth of a gold coin so just showing how the quality of ore nowadays is, is, is really lacking and then goes on even more and this is the good part here it talks about u.s gold certificates 1929 versus federal reserve notes today has a picture of both notes side by side great depiction there then he talks about how you know this note here was backed by something it was not a liability it was an asset to the holder of it because you can re redeem it for gold whereas the note we have today is tied into the 19.4 trillion which will never be repaid back and so he goes on and talks about if you had a thousand dollar gold certificate at that time you could go to the bank and basically exchange it at the cashier and they would give you approximately 50 20 dollar gold coins and then if you took that same thousand dollar bill today went to the bank and asked for gold of course they'll laugh at you and he says basically because they have monetary gold and silver amnesia but he also made a comparison saying that if you took that, if you took a thousand dollars or ten one hundred dollar bills to a bullion dealer or a gold coin dealer and asked for a coin, you wouldn't wouldn't be able to get even an, an whole coin. You would get three fourths of an ounce of gold. So a thousand dollar bill, nineteen twenty nine, will get you fifty gold coins, where today you can't get one. So interesting to think about that, huh? Then as we go toward the bottom, he just says, while Americans have been suffering for 45 years of gold and silver monetary amnesia, precious metals 
religion will finally wake up the living dead. And so just a great article. He does a great job doing um, his work and uh, definitely worth checking out if you're interested. It'll be below. Here's the last article here from Daily Reckoning, and it's from Mr. James Rickards, and it's entitled Double Digit Inflation and the Rise of Gold. So he starts off this article here with just mentioning how central banking monetary policy is kind of in, in, a, at a, at a, in a bind because they're looking for that inflation target of 2%, but yet seeing that you having problems with you know, achieving that here uh, in the United States according to their statistics. So he mentions here that uh, it's proven extremely difficult just to get up to two. Personal consumption expenditures, or PCE, is a core price deflator, which is what he, the Fed looks at. Currently, it's about 1.6, 1.7%, but it's stuck there. And so the Fed continues to try everything possible to get it to two with hopes of it to hit at least three. But what he's saying basically is that once the Fed achieves that target number of two or perhaps three, then it, it, there will be no way of just, you know, dialing back and not having it go to four, eight, ten, or, or beyond that. And then he mentions that, you know, it's not necessarily about monetary policy. It's about behavioral psychology and that it's very difficult to get people to change their expectations. But if you do, it's hard to get them to go back to the to, to way they used to think. Because once inflation kicks in, in a sense, you know, it's going to be a confidence thing. And so if people lack confidence, they're going to be trying to get rid of paper a lot faster. And it'll be hard to, you know, dial things back. So that leads into his idea of, you know, here's where gold, uh, here's where, the, you know, the 10,000 per ounce number comes from for gold. And, then, you know, if you're familiar with Jane Rickard's work, you know how he kind of comes up with this. He takes the M1, M2, M3 and kind of divides by that type of thing and comes up with an ideal number, which, you know, seems to make sense on the surface. And so he talks about how central banks around the world, you know, are all in the same you know process of trying to reach targets at the expense of, you know, devaluing their currencies, of which, you know, ultimately it would be in your best interest to really begin now while things seem to be relatively calm from the mainstream media, especially to take time to get into, um, you know, metals right now. So interesting article as always. And then he kind of caps it off with saying that, you know, when the next recession hits, you know, the only thing that, you know, will be, you know, utilized is the SDRs as a way of kind of stimulating and, and pumping liquidity out into to the global markets. But yeah, by that point, you know, it, it, inflation will be through the roof and nobody won't have any confidence in paper. So the, ultimately, the end result will be mess metals at all time highs and things like that. And so anyway, so here's today's articles. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, also, looking forward to more feedback. Want to improve the, 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 the delivery style of these messages here and as well as, um, you know, just get better in general with uh, delivering the news. So hope all is well and I'll see you guys on the next update.